Grape Coon was a real-life penguin that essentially fell in love with a cardboard cutout of an anime character. Grape Coon is the er parasocial relationship. We peak with Grape Coon. And I was sort of raised in America when it was a cult of self-expression, and I was just taught, you know, express myself and have things to say, and everyone will care about them. And I think everyone was taught that, and most of us found out no one gives a shit what we think. So we flock to performers by the thousands because we're the few that have found an audience and then I'm supposed to get up here and say, follow your dreams as if this is a meritocracy. It is not, okay? I had a privileged life and I got lucky and I'm unhappy. Please help me. Please give me some of whatever it is that, that makes you complete. I want whatever that wholeness is that you just summoned out of nothing and you put into your work. You were complete in some way that I never was. I want to know how to, how to, I want to know how to be a good person. I want to know how not to hate myself. Please. It's a hard life, man. It's, a, it's not a hard life. It's a, it's a weird life. When there's so many eyeballs on you all at once and like everything you say is put under the microscope. Blah, blah, blah. It's so fucking weird. We were trying to figure out why PewDiePie had surpassed, you know, 30 million subscribers. And they had literally the most watched show in all of media. And I think when we had had the conversation, South Park had just done an episode about how mystifying that was. You're watching someone play Call of Duty and talk about it? PewDiePie. That this is what kids consider entertainment, is this guy Hello? shouting at video games or, or whatever. Or like, that didn't make sense to me. So I had made it a point since then to try to, because it is kind of my job to stay current on things a little bit, even though I'm hopelessly old. And what I had found was that a huge segment of the entertainment that's out there among the popular YouTubers, it really is just people hanging out and having someone to hang out with. And they will just sit together and watch a movie or something. And you're only watching it because you kind of get to like just be friends with them in the room with all you don't have to say anything. What do you like most about what you do? Honestly, as cliche as it is to say this kind of stuff, it's, it's the community aspect of what I do that's the most fun part of it all. Interacting with the people who watch your content. I think like the poison of, of now is fan interaction. You can be an actor and you can make a movie but there's so much time between when you start that project, when you get the role in that project, to when it's actually out and you can interact with people about it, compared to what YouTube is. Whereas I record this video now, it's probably gonna go up tomorrow, and I get direct feedback from you always, all the time. Yeah, somebody like started an account saying that they were my spouse. And it was kind of like, you people are all creeps. It can be a bit overloading sometimes, and some people from traditional media might think that that's a bad thing because it's too much, it's too much stimulus all the time. Did you know that there's a whole fan base dedicated to like my arms and my pit hair? I love it. I get to the big concert hall and I roll right through the front doors and Mark being the smart person he is and aware of what's going on, I believe he ends up noping out. I think he tries to go find uh, backstage. But uh, John and, and Jack follow me on in and immediately Jack is swarmed. Artists that just cater their fans and do all this stuff for their fans. Celebrity, which was like a byproduct of art, it's gone from it. Now it's just celebrities and people. I just want to meet you guys all the time. It's the, it's the best feeling in the world. It's, it's why I love doing YouTube. If you guys weren't there to meet, then it, I, it just wouldn't be worthwhile to me because you guys mean so much to me. But I didn't even know there was this many people at the concert. I don't think there was, but he is literally swarmed by 10, then 20, then 50, then 100 teenage girls. It is like Beatle mania. They are clawing all over him to get a hold of him. And they're, they're like taking pictures with him. They're trying to touch him. I try not to think about fans. A part of me loves you. I, I wouldn't do this if you weren't there watching, and I really love you guys to bits. Part of me hates you. Sincerely. Part of me needs you. Part of me fears you. We get to the green room, and I expect Jack to be livid with me, or at least livid with the situation. And he's not mad at all, but he is exasperated, and I'll never forget, he says something to the effect of, Oh, Boogie, I'd love to meet every girl there. I'd love to meet every girl in the world, but I can't do it. There's only one me. There's thousands of them. They all want to meet me, and I, I, I can't do it. I can't take a picture with every girl here. There's uh, there are thousands of girls here. The relationship between 
follower and Instagrammer and the, then, the and psychology of how perceived. that can affect you like on both sides. I respect you guys opinions a great deal and I listen to you every single day from the stuff I'm doing and I try my best to do right by you guys and I hope I'm doing you guys proud. I feel like the best thing I can give people is what I believe I should do regardless of what they think. I love you. I've, I've seen people say, I don't know if he cares about us anymore, but hopefully any of you who were there over the weekend can tell that I really do. Videos of them opening up gifts from their fans and talking about it. And I'm like, where, where the f are, what the f is happening? The truth is my biggest problem's you. I want to please you, but I want to stay true to myself. I want to give you the night out that you deserve. Because I'm having the time of my life doing this stuff and I never want anything to change too much. I want to still do it for fun. I want to still be... I want to still feel like a friend to all you guys. But I want to say what I think and not care what you think about it. You mean how I could never want to be with a pitiful human like yourself? Wasting away playing games and watching anime? Probably never going to amount to anything in the rest of your sad, pathetic life. She's supposed to just stay stationary for this half hour while this fake imaginary boyfriend talks to her and compliments her, makes her feel good about herself, and then she goes one more day without killing herself. All right, that, that was that was mean. For me, what I do is when I'm gonna eat dinner alone <laughs> um, with my dog in my creepy house, I like to turn on a video of somebody eating food and talking. And it kind of makes you feel like you're eating dinner with somebody. That is so fucking sad. When I say it out loud, holy shit. I never thought that a female would cry for me. Right. <laughs> I always thought that was the most insane thing when I would look on TVs and they'd be crying, you know, you know, for Justin Bieber, Usher, and stuff like that. Right. That happened. Six young ladies running to me, boom, rushed me. All got tears in their eyes at the same time. So I'm tripping to myself. What, are you, what, what happened? You want them? Something happened to my people? It's like no. We love Section 80 so much, we were just talking about it and we all just broke down in tears and we seen you and we thought it was just meant to be to see you. Since we were talking about it, I was like, whoa, that's crazy. I couldn't believe it. It's about real happiness that you can't get with 3D. And, and it's the first movie I've seen that really captures the kind of psychology of like a parasocial relationship, which is that one-sided relationship where you you follow someone on Instagram or Twitter or whatever, and you feel like they're your friend, even though they don't know you fucking exist. W without, um, it's a scary, scary world uh, yeah. when it comes to that stuff. If you had the option to truly dive into your fantasy, a perfect world to escape your reality, would you say no? Of course, you never really wanted us to be real. They're lying to you, that's all. They're lying. Entertainers, they are lying and they are manipulating you and it's not in the good way. It's like advertising. You deserve better. I'm not saying I'm it, but I'm the guy that says you deserve better. You go get better. You say, thank you, weird man. Bye. <laughs> Anyone watch us celebrity lip syncing on The Tonight Show? You know? It's the end of culture. Culture's over, everybody. We lost. <laughs> this is entertainment. How is this entertainment? People we've seen too much of, mouthing along to songs we've heard too much of. And this is the bread and butter of American television. And it's always one of two things on celebrity lip syncing. It's either a male celebrity lip syncing to a woman's song, <laughs> but he's not. Or it's a rich, young, white actress, ironically lip syncing to a hip hop song. <laughs> The police coming straight from the underground. Can you believe this song was once an honest articulation of class struggle? <laughs> fuck these people. How dare they think that them fucking around is worthy of your attention? Them playing Pictionary, your attention's a valuable thing. I worked for three years to get it for an hour and I barely get there. See? It's like, you know these people actually do a job, right? They actually are supposed to give you a, a tangible service you know, beyond just you liking them. Like they're actually supposed to give you something concrete that you can, that can affect you or you can pass along or will mean something to you or, or will stay with you. And it has become this like IV drip, this just constant distraction or, um, yeah. If I didn't have you here, I'd fall apart. I wouldn't know what to make. I wouldn't know what I was doing was right. I need that validation, like the game was saying. Uh, makes me run the other way. <sighs> like a flock of fans, you know what I'm saying? Like big groups that swarm on you a little bit, so you gotta kinda like gauge it, like is this dangerous, is, can this get out of hand? And then once you make that quick decision, I'm, I'm out of there. Out of there. 
Yeah, yeah. And if I didn't already love Jack, I would love Jack there because he wasn't worried about himself. He wasn't worried about the mistake I made. He was worried. He was worried about disappointing his fans. And that's, I mean, that's a true YouTuber. I, I you gotta love somebody who feels like that. An honorific is a title or word implying or expressing high status, politeness, or respect. You probably know the Japanese honorific san, which is similar to Mr. or Mrs. in English and communicates respect, whereas kun is used by persons of senior status in addressing or referring to those of junior status, or by anyone when addressing or referring to male children or male teenagers. Grape kun was a humble penguin at the Tobu Zoo in Japan named for the purple identification band strapped to his wing. Grape Coon had a mate named Midori who, after he had to leave the enclosure for a period of time due to health problems, left him for a male penguin who was younger than him. Humboldt penguins typically mate for life, and Grape Coon, as you can imagine, was devastated. That is, until the anime Kimono Friends ran a promotion at Tobu Zoo, and Hululu entered Grape Coon's life. To quote a Sora News 24 article on Grape Coon, while the other animals paid no attention to the cardboard cutouts in their midst, Grape Coon became so enamored by his 2D visitor that he couldn't tear his eyes away from her. And it wasn't long before photos began surfacing online, showing the penguin staring up at her for hours at a time and refusing to leave her side. The Daily Mail is hardly a reputable source, but they were accurate when describing penguin mating rituals, which Grape Coon displayed when trying to court Hululu. <laughs> Grape's true feelings were all but confirmed when he was observed standing before the cutout with his wings outstretched and his beak pointed up. This stance is a courtship ritual in the penguin world and an indicator that Grape could be ready to take his relationship to the next level. A Metro article stated that it was so all-consuming that he neglected to eat his meals, meaning zookeepers had to remove the cutout. When the cutout was taken away, Grape Coon began eating again, but it was obvious that he was deeply missing his cardboard soulmate. The zoo has since embraced the penguin's unusual crush by broadcasting updates of the couple on social media. It describes how the Tobu Zoo profited off of the attention Grape Coon received, saying, In fact, they're so in love with the idea of their penguin being in love, that they've even started selling a loving grape drink in the gift shop, describing it to customers as the perfect embodiment of Grape Coon and his cutout's relationship. Who doesn't love a good marketing opportunity? The label states that the white and deep purple mix together beautifully, yet the ice cream makes you feel cold, to remind zoo-goers of two penguin souls that yearn to be together but remain in separate dimensions. This is all real. This is a real thing that actually happened. After some time, Grape Coon fell ill and was dying. In a Straits Times article, Tobu Zoo's penguin caretaker, Eri Namoto, said, We put the cardboard panel next to him to comfort him to the very end. The goodbye tweet from the zoo to Grape Coon when he died, translated into English, reads, The Humboldt penguin Grape Coon passed away yesterday. Sincere thanks to everyone for supporting him until now. Thank you also to Hululu, who watched over him until the very end. And thank you, Grape Coon, for all this time. Rest peacefully in heaven. From the Technology Inquirer, even Kimono Friends manga artist Mina Yoshizaki drew up a special illustration of Hululu with Grape Coon. In the illustration, they wear matching purple bands as if these were wedding rings. A waifu is a fictional female character from non-live action visual media, typically an anime, manga, or video game to whom one is attracted. I don't want to spend too much time getting into waifu culture. If you're interested, in 2012, video essayist JT Sexkick published a video essay called Waifuism and You that you can check out. Sex Kick has a background in Chan culture, and I don't agree with some of his language, including slurs, or some of what he says in his essays, but I still find value in them and in the research that he does. Waifu as a lifestyle? What? His waifuism essay is an honest examination of the phenomenon from someone who is very familiar with it, and the enraged comments he got in response show that he definitely struck a nerve. My waifu was basically like a joke. It was a facetious, tongue-in-cheek way of being like, oh, I like this character, or she's really cute, or something like that. What's interesting, though, is the thing that the word has come to represent now, which is an obsessive commitment to a fictional character. This whole concept is so baffling to me. Giguk also made a couple of short films dealing with waifu culture called Your Waifu is Real and Your Waifu Doesn't Love You that would be further illuminating to the uninitiated. Was I created to research the cure for cancer? Solve world hunger? Oh no, we just want you to be the imaginary girlfriend to a bunch of guys. Brilliant. I think I understand. This whole waifu culture, it's like some self-aware meta joke. Correct, for the most part. And nobody would really choose to have a waifu if they actually existed. Hello? Or there's also the whole 3D pig disgusting thing, which, I mean, you know, uh, that is still mostly a joke. But uh, there's, there's still this undercurrent of misogyny 
among this this uh, this circle of people. Anime nerds into waifu culture related strongly to Grape Coon and responded with an outpouring of support. The Straits Times piece phrases it as, The plight of the romantic penguin went viral, earning great millions of fans worldwide. A Sora News 24 article on Grape Coon is titled, Japan's anime-loving penguin turned to comfort of a 2D girl after being scorned by his 3D wife. Subtitled, Lost his real-life penguin wife, gained an anime waifu. Were Grape Coon a human, his situation would have elicited at least a few cries of, He should stop obsessing over anime characters and look for a real girl instead. But it turns out that Grape Coon did indeed have a 3D romantic partner, and it was only after that relationship fell apart that he found comfort with his 2D crush. Having lost his companion, Grape Coon began spending more time apart from the other members of the Penguin Colony. Then, like a lonely, lovesick otaku taking refuge in anime indulgence, he became enthralled with Hululu. Once a cardboard standee of the character was placed near the Penguin habitat as part of a cross-promotion with Kimono Friends. A Vice piece titled, Love is Dead, and So is the Penguin Who Fell for a Cardboard Cutout, states, Fans of Grape seem to be taking his death pretty seriously, referring to him as a person, imagining his service as a soldier's funeral, even starting a Change.org petition, begging the zoo to erect a statue of Grape and Hululu in his honor. The piece ends with, So long, Grape Coon. May we all find someone who looks at us the way you looked at that cardboard cutout. From the BBC. Sadly, his death comes a month before the zoo's Grape Festival, a series of events spanning two weeks based around the celebrity penguin. Grape Coon didn't know what anime is and didn't understand marketing or branding or current See, but the Tobu Zoo sure knew how to make money off of him and off of his story. Look into part two of Fake Friends, my series on parasocial relationships. Part one is an introduction to the term and an explanation of the concept and its academic background, so you should check that video out before you watch this one. This episode is a broad exploration of different examples of parasocial relationships. I also want to give the same disclaimer from the first essay that a discussion of a media figure or content creator in this essay because they're a relevant example does not mean that I endorse them or their work or their beliefs. Some people I talk about I know are awful and for others I don't pretend to know that much about them or their field, so blanket content warning and viewer discretion advised for anything that I mention in this essay. I used a lot of fairly obvious examples of parasocial relationships in the first video. Mr. Rogers, Dora the Explorer, Let's Players like Markiplier, Bob Ross, etc. I did also intentionally focus on what I consider to be the creepy and exploitative nature of a lot of parasocial relationships. But not every instance of a parasocial relationship, even one that's deliberately fostered and profited off of, is inherently evil. Harp seals, also known as saddleback seals, are born yellow-white before their coats turn white then gray. They're goofy and adorable, especially as pups with big black eyes against the white fur and snow. So, when Takenori Shibata of the Intelligent System Research Institute of Japan's National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology was designing a therapeutic robot, he chose harp seals as a basis for his design. Paro is a robot alternative to animal-assisted therapy, a simulated therapy animal who never needs to be fed or cleaned up after and who won't ever get sick or die. I talk about Paro in my Uncanny Valley essay, a companion essay to this series that deals with inhuman objects that try to pass themselves off as human, and our relationship with them. Check it out if you want further elaboration. Here's an excerpt from Adam Peori's popular science piece titled, Will your next best friend be a robot? To make Paro realistic, Shibata flew out to a floating ice field in northeast Canada to record real baby seals in their natural habitat. In addition to replicating those sounds in the robot, he designed it to seek out eye contact, respond to touch, cuddle, remember faces, and learn actions that generate a favorable reaction. Just like animals used in pet therapy, Shibata argues, Paro can help relieve depression and anxiety, but it never needs to be fed and doesn't die. In It's Not a Stuffed Animal, It's a $6,000 Medical Device. Paro the Robo Seal aims to comfort elderly, but is it ethical? By Ann Turgeson and Miho Inada, published in the Wall Street Journal, they quote Sherry Turkle, a professor in the Science, Technology, and Society program at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, saying that she acknowledges Paro's potential as a communication aid, but warns against regarding it as a companion. Why are we so willing to provide our parents, then ourselves, with faux relationships? she asks, to further quote the piece. Shibata says he designed Paro to evoke memories of pets and babies. It weighs about six pounds, feels warm, and sucks on a pacifier-like charger. It doesn't do much other than utter weird sounds, like he or who, says Tomoko Imura, whose adult daycare center in Tsukuba City keeps its Paro in a closet. 
Paro's European distributor is the Danish Technological Institute. Denmark's Paro's are mostly purchased with public funds. The DTI, quote, requires caregivers to attend Paro seminars, where they discuss such issues as whether it's okay to leave an elderly person alone with a Paro, and whether patients must be told it's a robot. Don't allow someone to escape into a strange seal robot's universe, cautions Lone Gate. Senior consultant at DTI, Vincentian Collaborative, which runs several homes, has made Paro one of the many formal interventions used before staff medicate dementia patients who become very agitated or aggressive. まあ、瞬時にと言いますか、スッとこう落ち着いて、それでまあ笑顔になって気分が良くなって、で話もできるようになったりといったようなそういった効果が目に見えてありますので、それであのまあ薬を与えなくてもいい。パロ100%の人に
People seem to experience gratitude toward their Roomba, he says. They think it works hard and that it should take a break. They clean for it. They take it on vacation. It seems totally absurd. The Roomba doesn't even look like a person, but it does something nice for us, and since it moves, it can seem like an autonomous agent. Social robotics pioneer Cynthia Brazil, who directs MIT's Personal Robots Group, notes that the company iRobot has encountered a similar reaction from battle-hardened vets begging for technicians to fix their bomb disposal robots. They have soldiers coming back in tears, saying, Please fix my robot Scooby-Doo, because it saved my life, she says. I mean, these are powerful emotional attachments. And this is a completely teleoperated bomb disposal robot that wasn't even trying to be social. It's just part of the human experience and how we relate and engage with one another and the world. We are profoundly social beings. Such an attachment is troubling to some. Sherry Turkle, the director of MIT's Initiative on Technology and the Self, argues that what robots provide is the illusion of a relationship. And she worries that some who find human relationships challenging may turn to robots for companionship instead. Tufts Scheutz warns that elderly people who feel depressed could become more so if they misunderstand a robot's actions, or if the robot fails to correctly read human signals. There are just so many ways these interactions can go wrong, Scheutz says. We're pretty used to subservient female companions. Cortana, Alexa, Siri. And the creepy implications of these assistants are self-evident, but Gatebox is the peak of uncomfortable simulated female companionship. From Newsweek's holographic wife offers intimacy to Japan's celibate generation, to fill this intimacy void, a Japanese firm has come up with a holographic companion that allows its owner to enjoy a life with someone while still retaining your freedom. To quote from the Virtual Trends piece, a holographic virtual girlfriend lives inside Japan's answer to the Amazon Echo. Instead of a simple cylindrical speaker design, Gatebox has a screen and a projector, which brings Hikari, her name appropriately means light, to life inside the gadget. On the outside are microphones, cameras, and sensors to detect temperature and motion, so she can interact with you on a more personal level, rather than being a voice on your phone. Vinklu apparently is planning multiple possible personalities for Gatebox, which, as part of the device's backstory, is a gateway to the dimension the character lives in. As a side note, most of Hikari's personality seems to involve her wanting to please her master. And also... Uh, cooking eggs? Eggs? Her coming from another dimension reminds me of how Hulu's relationship with Grape Coon was described. <laughs> I found a 2007 Washington Post piece describing how two English security guards were so distracted by the game Virtual Woman that they missed the fact that their bank was being robbed. But when going back for a closer look, I could not find a reputable source for the piece. The Washington Post links to a website called Article Codex, which was useless. When I googled the title and author, I found two postings on Easy and Articles under the name Jane Trevay. Trevay's two articles were both about men being infatuated and obsessed with the Virtual Woman game. This article, about a man supposedly cheating on his wife with a virtual woman, references individuals and institutions that do not seem to exist. I downloaded Virtual Woman and played it, and it's horrific. You build a woman, and then the game tells you to try to get her to take her clothes off. I don't have any problems with video games having a sexual component to them, but Virtual Woman melds the uncanny valley and probably the worst chatbot I've ever tried to use. She just rambles disjointedly, ignoring most of what you have to say unless you directly hit on or insult her. It's a nightmare, especially the way the developers assumed you were along for the ride with their weird creepy fake woman fantasy. No wonder the only articles I can find about how great it is are mysteriously difficult to verify, along with the bizarre claim on its Wikipedia page that it's used by members of a Polar Station research team. The podcast clip from towards the beginning of this video is from the Crack podcast, and the man speaking is David Wong, real name Jason Pargin, and he's talking about online fame and YouTube content. What we are doing in podcasts, this doesn't seem that weird to me because this just seems like a radio show. You could have had this show in 1935 and it would have sounded about the same, only the subjects would be different, right? The first video essay I ever started, though I never finished it, was around 2012, and it was on Pargin's book John Dies at the End, which is a horror comedy where the two main characters are based on Parjan and his best friend, and I've been a fan of his writing for many years. So to hear him speak on the phenomenon is really interesting, especially because he considers himself such an outsider to it, despite having been such a big part of internet culture through crack for so long. He's a fan of the Milwaukee-based production company Red Letter Media, and even as he insults them, he describes their appeal. It's the four of them or the five of them hanging out and just watching a series of movies and videos and just, they're drinking the whole time and they just sort of riff on it, and it's very loose, it's not scripted, there's nothing to it because it's not replacing what Johnny Carson was to 
you know, my parents. Or at least I don't feel like that. It, it, it's not watching a, you know, a comedian interview a celebrity or watching a very talented person perform. It really is just the hanging out with some guys that are fun to hang around with. And I didn't grasp that until the last year and started clicking around and realized that almost all of the most popular channels are really just that. They're very unpolished. Like a hundred years ago, in terms of that being entertainment, I don't know if anybody could have predicted, but I also find myself enjoying that. Like, I find mean, there's some of these shows I look forward to way more than, you know, like a network sitcom that I watch, like Brooklyn Nine-Nine, which is like a mildly entertaining sitcom. But yeah, I, I would rather hang out with these guys for half an hour than, than watch that. And, and one of those things took $7 million to film and a and hundred people on the crew, and the other was just a webcam and some guys, you know, they entered out the dead spot. And their creepy fan base. If you go look at the subreddit devoted to their group or to any place where in the YouTube comments, it's all people speculating on their personal lives or one of them had lost a bunch of weight or talking about, you know, why did why did Rich shave the beard? He looks much better. Like, it's clear that they're talking about them as if it's part of their social circle. As opposed to if they were, if you had the comments underneath, you know, like a Louis C.K. stand-up, that it would all be about his performance, you know. Well, this wasn't as good as the special last year. I think he's, you know, he needs to, it's not like that. It's all in terms of these are friends. That's something I've noticed in the comments directed at me and just in the comment section of our articles is that I think some people, a lot of the appeal is feeling like, oh, this is just, these are just people like me and I'm one of their friends and speaking in a familiar way. We do get that for After Hours an awful lot. After yeah, yeah, Hours exactly. is one of our most successful shows and it fits pretty much the model of what Jason's talking about, but it has a little more polish to it because it's clearly scripted. But I mean, the comments are always about how Katie cut her hair or uh, Michael grew his beard and things like that and has almost nothing to do with the content of the video itself. So I think what it is, is it's, it's a conversation. You find a conversation you would like to be having and then you just listen to it. It's like inviting those people into your room. Yeah. And then you're just not participating and you're not adding to it at all. It breaks every rule of entertainment any of us learned when we were in entertainment school. All of us, all of us have our degrees mm -hmm. in entertainment. It's four schlubby guys, you know, at least one of them didn't shave. You know, two of them are overweight. They laugh out loud at each other's jokes. They're getting increasingly drunk while you watch. You know, the set is just like a curtain behind them. It violates everything. If you tried to pitch this to a network, no single element of this would work. Like American Networks are like the ones who said the three guys on Top Gear are not attractive to host a show in America. Like, no, everyone's got to look like a model. And you would have a much worse, much slicker version of it. And every bit of it, none of it could have been focus tested. What you feel when you watch it is 100% different Dan, even watching something like Mystery Science Theater 3000, where you, you've still got a team full of professional comedy writers and comedians writing, you know, riffing on jokes, making it tight, you know, making sure there's a beat every few seconds where it's polished. Whereas here, you'll have long stretches where they'll diverge on some topic or whatever. And it works because it is like just eavesdropping on a group of friends talking. And I don't think you could replicate it on purpose. Yeah, I think that's what podcasting is a lot. And I've noticed that people... You know, when, when they've known each other for a while, that really helps my ability to like a podcast as opposed to when you have, like, a stranger interviewing another stranger. And it's truly new. And it's something that it, it's hard to explain. Like, my wife doesn't watch anything like this. But if I was, you know, explaining, like, oh, yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm just watching, I'm, I'm editing an article in the background. These guys are just talking about a video game they played. You know, I'm watching them talk about it. It's very hard to explain why that would have, that would hold any entertainment value for anybody. But if you have like a pie chart of the minutes of total entertainment enjoyed by people under age 25 or whatever, this now has to represent like a quarter of it. Just the, the sheer number of subscribers and the sheer number of how many billions of minutes these YouTubers get watched, they have to have blown away network TV cumulatively a long time ago. From the description of a more recent episode of their Wheel of the Worst series, your inbred flyover friends from the Midwest that you'll never meet or be friends with spin a wooden wheel with obscure and terrible videos on it. Watch them watch the tapes, get drunk, and embarrass themselves.
The instant adoring boyfriend is a VHS tape Red Letter Media covered in a very early episode of Will of the Worst in 2013. And then next up, we have the incredible instant boring boyfriend. Adoring boyfriend. Oh! Oh, <laughs> I, I thought it said it, It's yet boring. to be decided if it's boring or not, but I think this is some sort of virtual boyfriend where you put it in and he talks to you. For incredibly lonely women. I, but not just women. I'm sure there's some men that would That's be okay. He, okay. he looks like a handsome fella. So at last a man who says all the right things, who is considerate, charming, gorgeous, and madly in love with you. Sounds too good to be true? Well, he's here. And he's all yours. I mean, basically, it's just a guy looking at the camera, and he's going to pretend he's your boyfriend. What it really felt like is a, a 50-year-old businessman uh, cynically saying, what can we uh, release that depressing uh, women with no lives will purchase to make themselves feel like they have a companion. She just wants that companionship. She just wants to feel like someone is there with her while she's also reading. 30 minutes at a time? Yeah, but but that the the, the woman so that the woman that's that sad and that lonely and that delusional where she puts on a video of of a young guy pretending uh, he's her boyfriend. Yeah. That's like a 1% well, on like the on the market. Oh, he's going to propose. Oh. Will you marry me? Comments on that video and elsewhere remark as a joke that Red Letter Media's videos and the tape serve the same purpose. Especially in darker places online, like 4chan, Red Letter Media and the likes videos are also referred to as friend simulators. There's a similar joke on lots of Red Letter Media's videos, along with videos of edgelord YouTubers, about suicide. Especially when a video is new, it'll get comments about how the person commenting is putting off killing themselves for, insert length of video. It's repeated over and over and over again. Over and over and over. And inevitably with plenty of likes encouraging it. It's as if the joke never gets old. Almost as if it isn't really a joke. And there's absolutely no indication, ever, from any of the Red Letter Media crew that they want or would appreciate comments on their appearance, our personal lives, or people using their content as a self-harm delay method, but those comments roll in anyway. In fandom, the word stan relates to being an overzealous or obsessive fan of a particular celebrity. It originates from the Eminem song of the same name about a frustrated fan of Eminem's who See, I'm just like you in a way. I never knew my father neither. He used to always cheat on my mom and beat her. I can relate to what you're saying in your song. So when I have a day, I drift away and put him on because I don't really got help. So that helps when I'm depressed. I even got a tattoo with your name across the chest. After not hearing back from his hero, emulates his music and kills himself and his pregnant girlfriend. And all I wanted was a lousy letter of a call. I hope you know I ripped all of your pictures off the wall. Damn. Basically, it's just about crazy fan mail that I get from people, and it's about like a kid who is really sick, you know what I'm saying, and, and, and takes everything that I say literally. Like if I say I'm going to slit my wrist, he wants to slit his wrist. It's like everything that I say he can relate to. It's like he finally found somebody that he can relate to. So at the end of the song, um, he ends up committing suicide and driving his girl off a cliff, and it's like really crazy. But it, it was a song, kind of. It's kind of like a message to the fans to let them know that, you know what I'm saying? Like, like everything that I say is not meant to be taken literally. Do you get letters like this? Yeah, I get crazy letters like that. That's yeah. why I was saying, you know, I don't understand. Like all this is is crazy to me. You know what I'm saying? I never knew that I was gonna have any of this. This is all. This is all, you know a little bit much for me. This is the best part. I actually have a gold-plated ring that I wear and I pretend I'm engaged to him. Wow. Isn't that nice? How old is she? 12? Uh, there are ways to talk about or reach out to a celebrity that are flattering and endearing, and there are ways that are creepy and invasive. Molly Lewis wrote a song for Stephen Fry, gay comedian and actor, about how she wanted to bear his child. I've got those child-bearing hips you always hear so much about. I have permission from my boyfriend, and he'd like to help you out. The song is obviously tongue-in-cheek, and when she performed it the night he won the Outstanding Lifetime Achievement Award in Cultural Humanism from the Humanist Chaplaincy at Harvard, she was much more distraught and embarrassed than he was. Hello, uh, Mr. Fry. Uh, my name is Molly. I know. Oh, Stephen Fry, I hope you'll tell us why you wouldn't want someday maybe to let me have your baby. We adore you, dear. I come before you here to be the only woman you will ever need. And my fertility is nearly guaranteed. Tools that you require to breathe. 
so send along your seed. Gabriel Gundecker wrote an album about wanting to meet Richard Dreyfus. I've tried hard to meet you, Mr. Dreyfus. I've sang songs and tweeted at Richard Dreyfus, but so far it's been a lengthy process for nothing. Where you at? Say hello. I don't want to go on a date, Richard. I just want to meet you face to face, Richard. And I know you've got some free time on your plate, Richard. Cause your friends direct and rate of sequels. Not close encounters, prequels. I've treated you better than I've ever treated ladies. And I'm in a darker place than you were in the 80s when you shot Whose Life Is It Anyway? But you don't remember a single day. Well, I do, and I can tell you about it. I can tell you about all your movies. I've seen inserts, and it was not that great. But you were great in it. I stayed up late to finish it. I'm familiar with your entire filmography. Quiz me. Okay, let's see. What movie was I in in 1993? Lost in Yonkers. A little weirder and more insistent, but still clearly an experiment and a harmless joke from a talented comedian and not the call of a stalker. Are you the guy that's been following, asking yes, to meet me? Yes, that's me. Yes, that's me. I'm so glad to meet you. Very good to meet you. Hi there. Very nice to meet you. Very nice. Yes. Good to know that you're not a stalker. No, I'm not a stalker. <laughs> I have this thing. I woke up to a knock on the door and I was like, oh, it might be, might be the postman, might be a bit of mail. Not too sure. Got up, all dopey. Uh, opened the door. Two Dibble fans. <laughs> How the f did you fall in my house? <laughs> Since I started doing YouTube, I lived in six different locations and I've had fans coming up to each and every single one of them. And here's the big surprise it's fing weird. It's so weird. It's so fucking weird. It's so weird. It's uh, uh. There's been a lot of YouTubers that have had to move house just because they have fans coming to the front door, like standing outside waiting for them to leave. Thankfully they couldn't, but they were trying to climb over the gate. Luckily I've got some, I've got some of this on footage. One guy was, was literally sitting by my house, by my gate for like an hour. I've had a lot of people come to my house. And they're not all bad experiences per se, but uh, it's just it's just generally not a good idea to go to a YouTuber's house. That's what I'm trying to say. Please don't come to my house. Just stop. Picture it like this. I don't know who you are, but I know that you found my address online and thought, hey, I'm going to invite myself over. You maybe recognized a tree out the front. You know, you maybe recognized a letterbox or a park or some type of a little blade of grass. You even recognize a little blade of grass. Ah, I know that blade of grass. Dibble lives there. Let's go knock on his door and visit him. And if you do decide to like randomly come to one of your favorite creator's houses, don't, just don't do it. Um, it feels really violating. You have to fit f***ing blinds! In our, in our window, so you just leave us alone. This was when I lived in Italy, and some guy that was on holiday in Italy came by our house. My girlfriend's mom opened the door and was like, There's a fan out there, you have to go! And I was like, okay. You know why it says actors in waiting? Because I didn't want to fucking go out. I was like, this is crazy, what the f*** are they doing here? You, just, you, you never know, you never know the intention of a fan. Um, who kind of breaches that line like they could just really really enjoy your stuff or they could be coming to kill you because they love you too much He was gonna interview me, but he was really bad at interviewing <laughs> I've had so many experiences with people who just don't seem to understand boundaries one night I was sitting in my hot tub in my backyard having a couple of drinks with my wife and my friends and out of nowhere some guy climbs up my fence and he starts talking to us. And I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Why are you here? He told me his name, and then he just he gave me a weird look, and he said, hey, are you Matt Shea? And I was like, okay, so obviously you already knew who I was before you climbed up my fence and peeked into my backyard. Here I am sitting down in my swimwear in my hot tub. You know, kind of a weird, really weird time to have someone talk to you, especially when they're hopping up your fence. And parents who bring their children to my house too? You, you guys should know better. Respect my privacy. I've even had parents coming over with their kids. I've had people yell outside my house. I had 
School class has come outside. Just because you found my address doesn't mean you found an invitation for you to come over. You can never, ever make friends with someone like that. It's not gonna happen. If you if you come to someone's house, creepily find their address, and then uh, and then expect to be friends, it's not gonna happen. Well, like, what are you doing here? What you know? It's not cool to just pop in like this in the middle of a work day. And he goes, "Oh, I know, I know." But here's the thing: I know we're gonna be friends. We're gonna be really close friends. We're gonna be best friends. And I'm like, "Well, buddy, I got a lot of fr friends as it is." And I appreciate that, but why do you think that? And he's like, well, because I will tell you something. I watch your videos all the time, and I can really relate to the stuff that you went through when you were a kid. And I just feel like we're brothers, you know? And I just feel like we're people of the same cloth. And I knew that once you got to know me, you and I would be really good friends. In 2011, YouTube singer Dodie Clark recorded a song about another YouTuber and how she wanted to be his friend and wanted to marry him. I'm not quite sure. Even including, yes, I am slightly in love with Charlie, as are 18726 other girls, <laughs> in the description, and calling it slightly stalkerish. It worked out for her, and she did end up recording a duet with him. Maybe she's a perfectly sweet person, but I know no matter how cute and sweet it was, I would not be super responsive to a song about being in love with me from a stranger. Earlier this year, a Serbian band recorded a song for Clark called I'm Just Trying to Say Hi, where the singer complained she never responded to his email and asked people to send her this song about her. So I wrote an email, thought it was neat, thought she'd reply. Turns out she did There's thousands of them writing. I just don't have the luck. The situation is super. Well, I'll be super as... Will you be my wingman and help my message fly? I gotta try to shoot straight to the sky Please send her this song, don't tell her why I would be so kind I'm just trying to say hi She snapchatted and commented and tweeted her mixed feelings about it What's happening? I gotta try to shoot straight to the sky. We're in Serbia. There's a fucking band. <laughs> what? Like there's different sections. I think he does a monologue at this point. And then it goes like back into the band. It's just so there's a stage light. It's just so much. It's so much. Who are all these people? I don't understand. What's she playing? What? <laughs> Send her this link. This song. Charlie Lopez boy link. Or over there on Twitter. Twitter. Saying stuff like, Yo, being well known online is weird. And can't tell if I'm creeped out, impressed, amazed, confused, worried, astounded, irritated, grateful. I think all of them, lol. At least six of this dude's friends enabled him to make a highly insistent and inappropriate song for his internet crush. I've used a whole bunch of Bo Burnham song clips, so let's switch it up and talk about John Darnielle. Darnielle is best known as the founder of the band The Mountain Goats. On his album The Sunset Tree, Darnielle explored having grown up with an abusive stepfather. It's an intense and moving album and one that has meant a lot to a lot of people. Up the Wolves and This Year are the kinds of songs multiple people I know personally have described as life-saving. The motor screaming out stuck in second gear The scene ends badly as you might imagine In a cavalcade of anger and fear There will be feasting and dancing In Jerusalem next year I am gonna make it through this year If it kills me Years to recover from all of the damage. 
In general, Darnielle's autobiographical songs about overcoming abuse, isolation, and drug addiction have had a tremendous effect on his fans, and he has a religiously devoted fan base. Beat the Champ is a later Mountain Goats album that is ostensibly a concept album about wrestling, but is described by Darnell as, quote, really more about death and difficult to navigate interior spaces than wrestling. This album is perfect for this discussion because here we have a man thousands of people have basically deified, and here's his album about characters in wrestling. Who they are versus who they're playing, how they get lost in performance, how this performance influences their lives, both good and bad, and it's imbued with plenty of the same autobiographical material that made the sunset tree such a resonant success. In wrestling, there are baby faces, or faces, and there are heels. That is, uh, there's, there's good guys and bad guys, right? The heel is the bad guy, and the face, which is short for baby face, is the good guy. A heel turn is when a face turns into a heel. It happens from time to time if you are a good guy. That you grow weary of being a good guy. It begins to grate at you. Turning away from adoration and love and doing the right thing, and turning toward relishing and being a villain reviled by the audience. Wrestling terms, by the way, have plenty of use outside of wrestling. When feminist YouTuber Lacey Green got red-pilled, I saw her sudden shift very aptly described as a heel turn. In kayfabe, a wrestling term that essentially means staying in character and maintaining the persona, the illusion, and the fourth wall, has plenty of application outside of wrestling. Heel Turn 2 is a Mountain Goat song that's about someone at the end of their rope giving up on doing good. Spent too much of my life now. For years and years and years and years President of the fan club up there choking on his tears Werewolf gimmick is about someone who gets a little too into their persona Get told to maybe dial it back Backstage later on Everyone still in this building right now Death before the dawn Foreign object is mostly about stabbing someone in the eye with a foreign object in the ring but even then, it still has great lines about desperation and doing something for yourself versus for an audience. March through the red mist, never get my vision clear. Learn to love this kind of atmosphere. Strike funny poses, keep my weapon hand low, whip my head around a little, get blood on the front row. The Legend of Chavo Guerrero is about Darnielle's favorite wrestler as a child, Chavo Guerrero. The song, especially when paired with its music video, is on its surface an upbeat and sincere ode to Darnielle's childhood hero, as well as an ode to wrestling fandom in general. A thorough look at this song, however, reveals something darker and more personal. It starts off subtly with lines like, Look high. And then with greater specificity. He was my hero back when I was a kid. You let me down, but trouble never once dead. You ran it down to try to get beneath my skin. Now your passion was scattered on the wind. I heard his son got famous. He went nationwide, coast to coast, with his dad by his side. I don't know if that's true, but I've been told it's real sweet to grow old. Darnielle's abusive stepfather would cheer for heels and openly make fun of Darnielle's heroes. Guerrero himself is in the video at the moment Darnielle looks directly into the camera and says that he's happy his stepfather is dead. You call him names to try to get beneath my skin. Now your ashes are scattered on the wind. The album was released in 2015 and Guerrero died in 2017. And it's absolutely wonderful that Darnielle was able to include his childhood hero who had helped him endure abuse, especially on such a fun album and such a complex song. 
John Cena has fulfilled over 500 Make-A-Wish requests. It's pretty incredible that he's been able to use his public persona to give a tremendous gift to 500 children with life-threatening medical conditions. Logan Paul, a tremendous idiot real-life heel, has done multiple Make-A-Wish fulfillments himself. Him being an idiot doesn't take away the meaning that those visits had for those now-dead children, even if he exploited the dying children as clickbait for views. A clickbait thumbnail. Cancer. From an ESPN piece on Cena. When he was diagnosed, everybody would tell him, you have to be strong and you can never give up, Maria Lanzer said. He was like, wow, mommy, that's what John Cena says. I'm like, see, if a wrestler tells you to never give up, then you can't give up. You have to fight and be strong. Many families stay in touch with Cena, sometimes writing that the time spent helped turn the child's attitude and physical condition around. He also receives heartfelt, thankful letters for brightening days for children who eventually died. Those are always difficult to read, Cena says, but at the same time, the strength of the parents and sending me a message about how much the time that I spent with their child meant to them, it's very special. A WWE piece states that John Cena's slogan, Never Give Up, is a constant source of inspiration for Wish Kids and serves as a reminder to stay strong and keep pushing through the difficult times, says David Williams, Make-A-Wish America president and CEO. The fact that he has had the sustained success required to reach 500 wishes speaks volumes about the type of person John is and the quality of the wish experience he delivers. There is no more humbling experience than a child who could ask for anything in the world asking to meet me, said WWE superstar John Cena. I have faced some of the toughest superstars in WWE history, and I've never encountered more bravery or toughness than I see in each wish kid that I meet. It is inspiring to see the impact that granting wishes can have, and I look forward to granting 500 more. It's bizarre to me to see the life and death struggles of children in the language of branding so nakedly intertwined. There are also loads of problematic aspects of wrestling and the myriad ways the WWE has mistreated its performers. And that's all important and relevant, and something that should be considered in any analysis or description of professional wrestling. As with any spectacle that spectators get something out of and form parasocial bonds with without necessarily considering the toll on performers. On the Mountain Goats Facebook page, someone recently posted, I am his mother. He passed yesterday morning, minutes after I played up the wolves for him. He had a hard battle with leukemia. I can only be grateful for your part in bringing him peace. From a creepy thread in the Red Letter Media subreddit, I was having a really hard time dealing with my father's illness. He was in and out of the ICU, getting multiple procedures, unable to really take care of himself. There wasn't much he could do beyond sit around slash sleep. On a whim, I decided to show him some best of the worst stuff, and he fell in love with the guys. It was nice to be able to enjoy something with my dad again, even if it was just some dudes on the internet talking about bad movies. Despite the difficulties we faced as a family, we were able to laugh and smile together again. I owe the RLM guys more than I ever thought I would. I haven't verified the claims in those comments, but they're ubiquitous enough with content creators of a certain level that it becomes clear that celebrities and media figures have a huge impact on people who are genuinely struggling. The delayed suicide jokes on edgy videos and the sweet, sincere comments about ill or dying relatives are all in the same vein. You can make videos of you watching VHS tapes, or goofy vlogs, or let's play videos, or videos of you eating food, or a song on your abusive stepfather album, and it could, completely unbeknownst to you, make a substantial difference in the life of someone who is really suffering. It isn't necessarily just one way. Either. Lisa Williams was a Walking Dead fan who recently died of cancer, and cast members seemed to genuinely mourn her absence as well. There was a mutually meaningful connection between her and the show she was a fan of. YouTubers like Markiplier are also very active Make-A-Wish contributors. I grew up on the internet, so I understand Markiplier's appeal even if I don't watch his videos or Jacksepticeye's or PewDiePie's recreationally. But I do have to wonder what it's like to be disconnected from technology and unfamiliar with it and find out a possibly dying child who gets one wish, who could wish for anything, wants to use that wish to meet up with a man who plays video games on the internet for money. I had initially only planned to talk about Markiplier in the context of Make-A-Wish contributions, but I found various clips about him and Jacksepticeye in the context of RPF, our real person fanfiction. What is this, archive of our own? Ooh, whoa, what is this? Works in Ethan Nestor. Okay, is this, is this like fanfics or something? You find fate to be unacceptable. What is this? I don't know what this is. I don't know what this is. RPF is fanfiction written about actual people, sometimes with self-inserts, fiction starring you and a character, and sometimes just writing fiction about real-life people, often sexually explicit. RPF-style self-insert quiz stories used to be popular in the early 2000s as well. Some folks you might never expect to have that much of an invasive, obsessive fan base have RPF written about them. Dodie RPF? Yeah. 
Hockey player RPF? Yeah. Charlie Brooker and David Mitchell RPF? Brooker said, Yes. Someone sent me some. I did read a bit, but not very far because I thought, I don't want this in my head. Is that what you're really like? Interviewers wanted to know. Lots of women find you attractive, you know. Just look at the internet. It was absolutely true that by googling my name, I could find lots of examples of people saying that they fancied me. Usually they added to their surprise. But then some people will fancy anyone who's on telly. That just turns them on. As sometimes does being funny. As does being unattainable. As does not being there in real life. All wrong, normal, unglamorous, unhilarious, hairy, human. Like people are when you actually know them. I get it a lot on Twitter. People saying they fancy me or asking their friends if it's wrong that they fancy me. Which is definitely a backhanded compliment. Or possibly a backhanded insult. It's all a bit of an ego boost, I suppose. But I think that moment of saying they fancied me would always be the high point of the relationship, so there's no need to take it any further. It dawned on me gradually that quite a lot of people who I didn't know were interested in my private life, or my apparent lack of one. I resented the interest. I didn't think, I don't think, that the specifics of my private life were anyone's business. I was just a purveyor of comedy. If people liked it, they could keep watching. If not, they should stop. I didn't want to encourage people to buy in too much to what I was really like. They couldn't know me personally, and I didn't want to be trapped into creating the illusion that they could. An illusion that might subsequently be shattered if I was caught on film strangling a cat. I love fandom and fan expression, but using actual people with actual lives, especially micro-celebrities like Let's Players and British showrunners and comedians who did not sign up for the same kind of established megastar social contract with its invasive obsessive fan culture the way a George Clooney or Kim Kardashian did, using them in a public way in a way that's sexually explicit is inappropriate. They're not together! No! Neil Cicerega, one of the most prolific content creators on the internet, found out about queer teenagers on Tumblr having arguments over mistaking him for a lesbian and whether or not they should be attracted to him. Cicerega is barely over 30, but he's been on the internet making videos and music for at least 17 years. He's certainly a ubiquitous figure, but there's nothing that he's done that would entitle someone to obsess over his appearance in that way. Or try to rebuke him when he expresses discomfort over being treated like some kind of public yardstick of sexuality. He's a person, and he's a person who's online all the time and everyone participating knew that there was a high likelihood of him reading what they said. And he did. Here's a clip of Jack Septiguy talking about RPF. <laughs> what are your thoughts about Septiplier? Oh god. I mean, what do- what are people expecting me to say? is a weird thing, because it started off as me and Mark just being good friends. And then... It was kind of just like a buddy-buddy kind of thing, and we were all happy and everything. And then people took it way too f***ing far. Except the player didn't ruin me and Mark's friendship or anything like that, so don't feel too bad about it, please. That I, I hated seeing people do that, and then other people were attacking others saying, You f***ing ruined their friendship because of Septa Player, which was, wasn't the case. Like, don't be dicks to each other. Um, it, it was just a case of, like, the whole... The homosexual side of Scepter Player that kind of got a bit out of control. And then even when me and Mark had said, like, please don't do that. We're like, we don't mind Scepter Player, but please don't draw us like fing each other. Then people went ahead anyway and they're like, oh, but it's so cute, look! And then people started role-playing and writing all these fan fictions about it that kind of seemed to go against anything that we had thought about or had said. Come on. At some point we have to grow up and be like. Yeah, this kind of went a bit too far. I think everyone in involved in that kind of knows that at this point. Otherwise you wouldn't be talking about it, and otherwise you wouldn't be asking about these types of questions. But, as far as like the pictures of just me and Mark, like hanging out and being like good friends and everything, those were awesome! I love that! That was cool! It's just some people had to shit in the swimming pool. <laughs> Some people were just peeing in the swimming pool, and that's fine because everyone pees in the swimming pool. But somebody had to come in and take a big old shit and then ruined the swimming pool for everybody. I still love you guys, don't worry, I don't hate anybody who did that kind of stuff. And I don't condemn anybody or anything like that. It's, it's just one of those things that went too far. <laughs> Do you ship Amy Plyer, Amy and Mark? I mean, that's the thing, they're a real couple. You don't really have to ship them one way or not, they're still a thing. With the Scepter Plyer thing, it was like, some people actually thought me and Mark were actually going to be a couple. Which, we've, we said clearly, like, no. Never gonna happen. Like, why did anybody think that? Um, and then it's a case of like, real couples come along. It's like me and my girlfriend, everyone's like, Oh, I ship Sep Tissue. It's like, well... We're an actual thing. It's not really a thing you have to ship yes or no on. And then it's not a thing that we need people's... 
we don't need people's validation on it whether they ship it or not. We're still gonna be a couple. Like, it's the it's the weirdest thing. It's one of those things that comes with, like, like popularity and uh, an influence online kind of thing. It's just it boggles my mind. Also, I found what appears to be Jacksepticeye and Markiplier Make-A-Wish RPF because fuck everything. After finding the RPF clip, I was clicking around and found a compilation video of Jacksepticeye crying while playing games. It starts off with footage of him playing That Dragon Cancer, which is a game I backed on Kickstarter in 2014, but have never played because I have never had a moment where I felt emotionally prepared to engage with it. This is sad because <laughs> it reminds me of the, the last few days when my granny was alive. And she didn't die of cancer or anything, but she she was locked away in like a hospital for the last few months of her life and she didn't really recognize anybody anymore. She was she was super like aware of everything. Oh god. Sorry, that's gonna sound terrible. She was super aware of everything, like her entire life and right up until she went into hospital. But as soon as she went into hospital and she was starting to get treated for, um, I, I can't remember what it was she had. She had something in her leg that spread through her body and affected her blood. But she was in hospital for a few months before she died. And her mind just completely went. And I remember going in one time with my sister to see her. And we were talking to her. And my granny was like, is Sean going to come in to visit us? I was sitting right next to her and she didn't know who I was. Uh, that was really sad. Again, she didn't die of cancer or anything. It's just reminding me of it. And I need to move on or I won't be able to move on. And just reading all the notes is really sad. And I feel sorry for anyone who has lost family or loved ones. Just in general, but especially to cancer because it's not a nice thing. And the last, the last while with someone who has cancer is not nice either. <sighs> okay. I'm sorry about knocking over the mic as well. I, I grabbed my sleeve and I hit the mic. I can see the waveform right now and it's just a giant spike. Thank you for playing for Joel Evan Green, J-E-G. Oh, he was real. <laughs> I was really hoping all that time it wasn't real, that it was just a story. I was one of the 250 people who put a small memento for a lost loved one in the game. I actually watched a playthrough of the mementos on YouTube just now, at the time of writing this paragraph, I mean, not of editing the video, and started crying. Bizarrely, and completely coincidentally, at the time of me writing this, it's the day after the anniversary of this specific person's passing. What does it mean that I can watch a man I've never met or interacted with cry while talking about his dead grandmother while playing a game two parents made to express their feelings about their very young son dying of cancer? A game a very, very, very small part of, I paid $40 to include a permanent embedded reference to someone that I cared about. What does it mean that coincidentally this whole weird journey happened within 24 hours of the anniversary of a nightmarish day in my life and was kicked off by me researching gay fanfiction of people who play video games online for a living? I stopped crying and went back after my whole bizarre emotional death game cancer roller coaster and finished the compilation video. It ends with a clip from this video. I'm gonna talk to you. <laughs> the character you got in the bad end was inspired by what I saw in a lot of messages of the fans who are in this game and by people I see in the comments of not only your videos but on Tumblr, Twitter, DeviantArt, Facebook. I know you will never see this message. I'm sorry if this message bother you bothers you. Some people feel like they do not contribute at all to any community or they are insignificant to the YouTuber, A, the YouTuber, and B, the fan base because they never made it into a vlog or never got to talk to you, their inspirations face to face. They think they don't matter and that is one of the saddest things ever, or at least to me. It also, it, sorry, 
it also gets to me in a big way as well because I get I get so many messages from people saying you're never going to read this message or you never reply to my messages or them feeling like they don't matter to anybody and that really breaks my heart because you guys really do matter to me not just to me but to the community as a whole like just being here being on the channel watching every day commenting liking sharing with your friends just being on Tumblr or Twitter or anything interacting with everybody else it means so much more than you think it does. You might feel like it doesn't, and I'm so sorry if I never reply to your messages, or you've been subscribed since I had 10 subscribers, and I've never, like, so replied to anything. I try my very best to get to as many people as I can. It's so hard a lot of the time, because there's so many of you, and I'm, I'm very happy about that, but just please know that I never ignore people. It's never a case of seeing the messages and purposefully not replying. I read as many as I can. I read a lot more than I actually get time to reply to. So just know that I've likely seen your message. I just can't reply to it. So thank you to everybody who's ever done anything for me. Whether it, even the people who hate me, who have just come to the channel and watched for five seconds. Just thank you for at least clicking on the channel or anything at all. Thank you all for being here. I really... I really don't know what I'd ever do without any of you anymore because I'm so used to like waking up every day and like going on Tumblr, going on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and just seeing messages from people on YouTube as well. I I'm I've gotten so accustomed to that that I I don't know. I don't take it for granted. I I mean, I guess I do in a small bit. Like if that ever just disappeared, I'd be so lost. I wouldn't know what to do. I'd I'd feel so alone. Because, I like, I don't interact with people on a day-to-day -day basis in real life. I go out, I go to the shop or whatever, I, like, buy food. But I never actually, like, sit down with friends anymore. I don't have any friends that I meet, like, day-to-day -day or talk to or anything like that. All my interactions are based online through you guys or through other YouTube friends. So, just thank you for being there for me. Like... You guys say that I'm there for you all the time, and I really, I'm very happy about that, but you guys are there for me as well, every day, and you say so, so much nice things to me, even like in this, there were so many nice messages for me. At the risk of sounding cruel, and of sounding dismissive, that clip is also profoundly sad, but it's uniquely tragic, and that what it depicts is, unlike cancer, preventable. I've had some online friends for over a decade, and I don't mean tragic in a way that devalues online versus face-to-face -face relationships. I mean tragic in that Jacksepticeye, real name Sean McLaughlin, has from my limited viewership of his videos seemed like a perfectly kind and positive and funny person. The fact that he feels this horrific weight, this pull of these pseudo relationships with millions of people that keep him from real life relationships and really any meaningful relationships outside of his YouTube circle is horrific. Thank you so much. You'll never know how grateful I am because I can never put it into words. As long as I live, I'll never be able to put it into words how grateful I am for this stuff. And I'm sorry if I've kind of gone off the rails lately with um, certain types of games and certain types of commentary. I'll try bring it back to these kind of things where it's longer and just more in touch with me. Where you get to know more about me, you get to listen to me a lot longer. It's not just all about dick jokes and like super highly edited stuff all the time. Um, I know a lot of you really like these longer videos that are uncut, and I'm sorry if I, like, let some of you down. <laughs> sorry. <sighs> Why does McLaughlin feel the need to cater to millions of people? Most of the comments on this compilation video are about cancer and death, or about the Walking Dead game segment in the middle of it. It seems like the fact that it ends with McLaughlin crying his heart out over not being able to please and connect with millions of people who are also his primary social interaction and his primary source of affirmation and of income without him actually knowing or being close with them is largely ignored. It's fine. The fan-made game he's playing and reacting to so strongly is called Jacksepticeye's Paradox. He published that video in April of 2015. According to Social Blade, he had about 4 million subs at that time. That's around the population of Los Angeles. It's 8 or 9 times the size of Atlanta, the city I live in. I don't know if you've ever been to Los Angeles, but if you have, can you imagine being beholden to the whims of the numerical equivalent of every single resident of that city? McLaughlin is Irish. The current population of Ireland is less than 5 million people. That's like him feeling beholden to his entire country. 
and upset he can't have a close friendship with every other person in that country. I openly make fun of insincere, manipulative attempts to garner audience trust because I find them abhorrent. Maybe I'm naive, but I don't think McLaughlin crying about how much his subscribers mean to him is insincere. A lot of Let's Players overreact to jump scares in horror games, sure, but them crying while playing video games or talking about how much fans mean to them always reads as much more sincere because it's easier to fake yelling at a video game than it is to fake vulnerability. You can see the mask going right back up at the end of his video. The high energy and positivity, the smash that like button style brand cognizance. Just thank you so much, but also thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you liked it, punch the like button in the face, like a boys, and high fives all around. Whoosh, whoosh. But thank you guys, and I will see all you dudes in the next video! Also, it's worth noting that the compilation video I saw this clip in is a cynical remix of the same clips used in another compilation video that was obviously thrown together by someone completely unrelated to him or to the That Dragon Cancer developers to milk ad revenue. Jacksepticeye's emotional response to fans wanting more of him than he can give reminds me of the Decemberist song, A Singer Addresses His Audience. We know, we know, we belong to ya. We know to change some, you know, to belong to you. Here's an excerpt from a Salon interview with lead vocalist and songwriter Colin Malloy. I mean, of course, it is a reflection of my trying to make sense of the relationship between singers or entertainers and their audience. But I also wanted to try and write in the voice of what I imagine was, like, the lead singer of a boy band who was just trying to figure it all out who had never known any other life other than being on stage and being the sort of property of a fan base. How would they sort of view their lives and live their lives? But then, you know, of course it's populated with my own weird ideas about what that relationship is. But in the end, it's a different character as opposed to myself. And it's an exploration of the loneliness of the singer. And why did they do this in the first place? Sacrifice or give themselves up to the needs and the expectations of people who don't know them, complete strangers, and construct their lives and the decisions they make creatively around what those expectations might be. And in the end, they do belong to them. It's kind of this idea of possessiveness. They don't necessarily belong to themselves. But the reason the singer was even doing it in the first place was just really like the refrain in the end. To belong, to belong. In a Rolling Stone interview, when talking about the same song, he said, that relationship between bands or singers and their audience, it's kind of a funny relationship and abusive in its own right, going both ways. I shouldn't say abusive, but it can be antagonistic. I think that it's an odd relationship. And it's just that particular singer trying to come to terms with that aspect of it. Having an audience, you may want to continue doing things on your own terms but that becomes more challenging when there are expectations. And audiences have more of a voice than ever with the advent of the internet. While I may not be cowed by it, I can imagine a singer with thinner skin would be terrified by that. always been humbled and flattered that people have attached themselves to certain aspects of the Decemberists. A less serious portrayal of similar sentiments to Stan or the Decemberist song would be Kanye West's I Love Kanye. I miss the sweet Kanye, chop up the beats Kanye, I gotta say, at that time I'd like to meet Kanye. See, I invented Kanye, it wasn't any Kanye's, and now I look and look around and there's so many Kanye's. I used to love Kanye, I used to love Kanye, I even had the pink polo, I thought I was Kanye, and I love you like Kanye loves Kanye. <laughs> Bo Burnham's song that I use clips of in this video is called Can't Handle This Kanye Rant, and it's in part a parody of Kanye West's self-obsessed theatrical ranting style. Talked about his problems. 
race, power. His $90 t-shirts weren't selling very well. That was most of it. I'll be honest, my problems are not as high stakes as Kanye's, but I have problems. And in part, Burnham using that as a template for a painful, vulnerable exploration of his own issues. I don't think that I can handle this right. I don't think that I can handle this right. So look at them, they're just staring at me like, come and watch the skinny kid with a steadily declining mental health. And laugh as he attempts to give you what he cannot give himself. I don't think that I can handle this right. I don't think that I can handle this right But they don't even know the herb of this right but they don't even know the herb of it But I know I'm not a doctor I'm a pussy I put on a silly show I should probably just shut up and do my job So here I go Wouldn't I got the letters if I knew it wouldn't fit Wouldn't I got the cheese if I knew it wouldn't fit Wouldn't I got the peppers if I knew they wouldn't Wouldn't I got ham you can tell them anything if you just make it funny, make it rhyme. And if they still don't understand you, then you will run it one more time. The movie Ingrid Goes West is a great example of a parasocial relationship gone wrong. As Red Letter Media describe in their review, Ingrid is obsessed with the Instagram of a woman named Taylor, and from there, with enough time and money and stalking and manipulation, she worms her way into Taylor's life. You know, there's like a pressure to kind of keep posting photos and, and keeping up this facade. And then on the Aubrey Plaza side of, yeah, just wanting to achieve what is essentially fake. Yeah. Of note also is Ingrid's landlord, who has an obsession and parasocial relationship with Batman. He's there's a very, bad, there's but... a very odd sex scene with her dressed up as Catwoman. Yes, yes. <laughs> Ingrid Goes West reminded me of World's Greatest Dad, which, without spoiling either movie, is a darkly funny exploration of who someone is versus who their fans like to believe they are. My absolute favorite depiction of an obsessive fan, though, because of how fun it is and how much it defies convention, is Bartolomeo from One Piece. One Piece is huge. It's been going over 20 years and is a cultural juggernaut, and I'm sure its author, Eiichiro Oda, is aware of the impact his comic has had on millions and millions of people around the world. Super far into the series during a tournament arc, Bartolomeo the Cannibal is introduced. He's disrespectful and frightening and an over-the-top heel. He even throws a fake bomb into the audience. Bored. He's strong and scary and disrespectful and doesn't remotely care about his own reputation. Fans are often portrayed as obsessive, neurotic, subservient, and effeminate, either an Ingrid-type stalker character or a comic book guy-type miserable pedant nerd. Bart is so fun because he is intense and intimidating and his own person completely, and also a huge, huge nerd for and fan of the main characters. Luffy is in pain! Ah! 
What sets this specific example apart and why I like it so much is that one, Bart is treated neither with disdain nor reciprocated obsession, but instead with bemused yet friendly indifference, which to me is much healthier. <laughs> そう言ってもらえると嬉しいべ。褒めてねえよ。先週部分をお待ちさせてもらったんですっぺ。目つき悪いぞ。俺は今猛烈に感動しているこの<笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑> And two, he has his own stuff going on. He isn't trying to control or even really be a part of what he's a fan of. And he has his own life and his own goals and his own friends completely separate from what he's a fan of while still maintaining his enthusiasm. Yes! Yes! Oh, yes! Mm. I definitely think that all the YouTube comments here are accurate and that Bart is an insight into how Oda sees his fans and how he would like his fans to be. Game designer Patrick Miller was talking about a development conference recently and said, The best networking advice I've ever heard was to spend less time trying to win the approval of the folks you look up to and more time cultivating relationships with your peers. Networking is a long game and the people who fuck with you when you ain't shit are the ones you keep close. To which animator and artist Ara Triolo responded, This, and also I just want to say for the record that in my experience, if you exist in a space long enough making cool stuff, the peeps whose approval you want will naturally notice you in a much healthier and less one-sided way. Looking up to and worshipping people you interact with is... Uh, mutual admiration is... The central tragedy of Ingrid is that if she'd just been kind and respectful of boundaries, then she would have absolutely been able to be friends with Taylor. No problem. I don't think it's any shocking spoiler to say that their friendship has some problems. Syndrome from The Incredibles is also an example of a sort of dark inverse of Bartolomeo. Bitterness at rejection by his hero turned him into something much worse than he would have been otherwise. After all, I am your biggest fan. Great Coon's story is similar to the story of Nigel the Gannet, who garnered headlines like, Nigel, the world's loneliest bird, dies next to the concrete decoy he loved. Nicknamed No Mates Nigel, the ranger who found his corpse said the experience was incredibly sad. Nigel's story is particularly tragic because it happened less than a month after three real Gannets arrived on his island after years of him being alone. He mostly ignored them. From the Washington Post. In the absence of a living love interest, Nigel became enamored with one of the 80 faux birds. He built her a nest. He groomed her chilly concrete feathers, year after year after year. He died next to her in that unrequited love nest, the vibrant orange-yellow plumage of his head contrasting, as ever, with the weathered, lemony paint of hers. Whether or not he was lonely, he certainly never got anything back, and that must have been a very strange experience. Conservation ranger Chris Bell, who also lives on the island, told the paper. I think we all had a lot of empathy for him, because he had this fairly hopeless situation. Nigel's story resonated enough that there's a puzzle game you can play based on it. And, like Cicerega, his story became a weird lightning rod for distorted takes. Such as journalist Nicole Serratore using Nigel to talk about rape culture. There are plenty of other opportunities for us to use parasocial relationships as a way to talk about rape culture that may be more appropriate. When Aziz Ansari was accused of forcing himself on a woman 10 years younger than him, the Babe piece discussing the incident read, Speaking to Babe, Grace mentioned the glaring gap between Ansari's comedy persona and the behavior she experienced in his apartment as a reason why she didn't get out earlier. I didn't leave because I think I was stunned and shocked, she said. This was not what I expected. I'd seen some of his shows and read excerpts from his book, and I was not expecting a bad night at all, much less a violating night and a painful one. And one of the angry Facebook comments in response talks about how Ansari is a good person, as if the commenter knows him or has any idea what kind of person he actually is. From Victoria Sands, The Swift Life monetizes and exploits fandom. In Bitch Media, a piece about an exploitative app Taylor Swift released, Swift's actions are deliberate and well-crafted to develop the parasocial relationship between herself and her devoted followers. And, these days, most celebrities speak to fans directly on various social media platforms. But Swift, in particular, has developed a specific strategy of friendship that goes beyond simple connection or contact. Her presence online is less, here's special access for you to watch my life, and more, trust me, see me as a friend, and then become a part of my life. 
when Swift, as fans report after meet and greets, appears to have remembered their first names and some measure of their online persona, buys them personalized gifts, and indulges in their inside jokes, she is partaking in the realm of online friendship and emotional investment that explodes through pop culture sites like Tumblr. With the Swift life, fans of Taylor who have proven to be unfailingly active and supportive online can be successfully ushered into a platform controlled by Swift through which she profits. Plus, with Swift's public standing in serious question, it is her quiet, personal, and direct appeals to her loyal fans that stokes their protectiveness over the real Taylor. And the anger and resentment from fans inside the bubble is often directed at the media, who they believe have been deeply unfair to Swift. As Tumblr user wrote, Swift's new music video illuminates how the media slash society have so tirelessly tried to absolutely sabotage Taylor Swift's soul, ravage her kind disposition, and quite overtly vandalize her reputation. Swift liked the post. I, uh... I don't love my fans. I have to be, I don't. And you don't want that. You don't want that desperate sort of cloying thing from an entertainer. My fans, oh, I, they stick with me through everything, through thick and thin. Do not stick with me through thick. If I stop entertaining you, throw me to the curb. I, you wouldn't stick with your mechanic if you stopped fixing your car. I am in a service industry. I'm just overpaid, okay? <laughs> and a lot of, I feel a lot of artists, pop artists especially, sort of infringe upon the responsibilities that just aren't theirs in terms of their audience, maintaining their audience at an emotional level. I, some of you might be sad and going through things. I feel for that. Life is tough. I'm not going to fix that with a song. I understand the impulse to shy away from romanticizing bird loves cold fake bird who will never love him back because we do have a culture that prioritizes lovesick men over the agency of women. But analyzing celebrities who leverage their power and, in the case of Ansari, their nice guy image may be a more valuable use of time than getting angry at a dead bird. Also, generally, it's good to keep a safe distance and a layer of emotional separation with these relationships so you don't end up insisting someone who you've never met is a good person or pretend you know the real them. This is especially true of personas who children are a fan of. I saw plenty of 13-year-olds defending Logan Paul during the Suicide Forest fiasco, and I would hate to think of how I would have handled that, let alone Daniel Kyer's suicide or JonTron's turn toward white supremacist gibberish at that age. Not that struggling with mental illness is at all equivalent to having a lot of opinions on crime statistics and ethnostates. Just that I would hate to be so emotionally tangled up in the lives of people that I don't know that their pain or controversy or racist opinions had a significant impact on my emotional development and my psychological well-being. There are too many great examples of parasocial relationships for me to go deep into detail with all of them. Best Worst Movie is one of my favorite documentaries because it interrogates how poisonous ironic fandom and ironic love are and how you shouldn't turn away from real people who know the real you to bask in them. Davy Reedon's game The Beginner's Guide is another great example of how poisonous and invasive fans can be. And I have to be honest with you, this idea is really seductive to me. That I could just play someone's game and see the voices in their head and, and get to know them better and have to do less of the messy in-person socializing. I could just get to know you through your work. I think this is that why message I is sad. I hated Mother, but I do have to admit that there's a moment in that film that, as comically over the top as it is, lands pretty well how Aronofsky feels about clawing entitled fans. Chapo Trap House is a popular, irreverent leftist comedy podcast, and in one episode, Matt Chrisman, in the context of the 2016 presidential election, brought up the Harry Harlow rhesus monkey experiments. I've known about the experiments for a long time, but I had never considered them in the context of parasocial relationships until hearing Matt's rant. It's only going to get worse, folks, because I have realized that this campaign, the closest analog I can think of is that in the 1930s, there was a psychologist named Harry Harlow who did a series of experiments to find out what the source of a child's appreciation for their parents was. So he set up a tank with infant rhesus monkeys and he gave them two mother figures in his tank. One of them was just a bare wire structure, but it also contained inside of it the milk that the monkey needed to lick. The other one didn't have any milk, but had was covered in sort of a carpeting to give the monkey like solace. The test was to find out which one he preferred. Was he just going where the food was, or was he looking for something more? Uh, and for our purposes, let's just say that the Trump campaign is the carpet mother, and the carpet is, you know, the hair, obviously, <laughs> and the wire mother is Hillary, and the milk bottle is non-refundable tax credits and Beyonce gifts. <laughs> and now, it doesn't really matter for our, our purposes which the monkeys preferred, but I think what's important to remember is that in the actual experiment, the monkeys who, for our purposes, are the American electorate, 
all went insane. You might turn from an uncaring and alienating and stratified culture that's technically real and tangible, a wire mother that feeds you but offers scorn and rejection, and toward a carpet mother, a concrete gannet, an anime cutout, a gatebox waifu, a friend simulator. We're not monkeys trapped in an experiment doomed to die, though. Nigel finally had company in the last months of his life, and he spurned them for a cold, concrete facsimile. I got a handful of defensive comments on my first parasocial video about how fake friends are better than no friends. Fake friends are good when you have no other option, but there's a third option available of putting in the time and the effort to meet actual people, form actual relationships, live your own life, rather than obsessing over and living vicariously through someone intangible. Parasocial relationships can be healthy, but they should never be your focus. Not for fans and certain certainly not for personas. What kind of shonen protagonist would the Straw Hat Pirates be if they went on adventures just so they'd get affirmation and attention? They're great characters because they reject being seen as heroes. And I don't want to watch the Red Letter Media guys open fan mail or see them do vlogs. J. Bauman actually did a whole series of fake vlogs on his own channel, where clickbait thumbnails led to nothing but strange time lapses with ambient music. I totally understand the appeal of Critical Role, but since I have the option, I would honestly rather spend those four or five hours playing D&D with my friends rather than watching strangers play. I get that not everyone has that option. And that you can have a healthy social life and still enjoy something like Critical Role. But I hate the idea of someone giving up time that could have been spent having their own adventure obsessing over it. My friend JP, who has worked for a long time as a game designer and has had plenty of experience dealing with the industry, tweeted this recently. At the center of celebrity culture, there is no humanity no kindness or insight, no dragon energy, but an insatiable void, a pure and pathologically self-justifying will to power that feeds on attention and grasps for more. Have dreams, not heroes. You know, Richard, I never thought it would end this way. Shaking your hand at the Eckerd Hall in Clearwater, Florida. I was the only one there under 65. I guess that's how it goes. So I've met the man I went on stage and shook his hand But I feel unfulfilled There is something still wrong Was this a good life goal? I should have probably focused more on school Or learned a marketable skill Instead of writing celebrity songs I am tremendously grateful for and humbled by all the support I've gotten and messages I've received about how I changed someone's perspective or helped them feel better during a rough time in their life. All of that has profoundly impacted me. But I also try to keep a strong barrier up. I think someone like McLaughlin would be happier if he had better boundaries. Or any boundaries. The more I researched his work, the more he seemed genuinely kind and humble and understanding of the impact his videos have on viewers, including viewers who are isolated or viewers who can't play games themselves because of disabilities. Awesome. I love letters because people, people really open up in text because a lot of people are, are very afraid to say stuff to you face to face and I did meet a lot of people who I could tell really wanted to say stuff and then they couldn't because, I don't know, anxiety or whatever kind of took over so they couldn't really say anything and then they give you letters so that kind of stuff then really hits home because they open up a lot more on their letters so thank you. These guys were making really cool ways for disabled people to play games. There was one that um, paraplegics could play Mario Kart and it was controlled with your chin or your nose or your face or whatever you wanted to control it with. It was like a, a, a knob that you would like stick your face to or a, a little like joystick that you would stick your face to and that you would move around with your face, which was so cool. And there was there was other ones for um, like hearing impaired and visually impaired stuff. So th those guys were doing a really great thing because everyone should get a chance to play games. Everyone should be able to play video games and I'm very privileged and very lucky to like live where I am in the society that I live in to be able to do this to even have internet to be able to upload the games to be able to afford to buy the games not everyone has those luxuries so I'm really fortunate and I'm very very um, lucky to be able to do that kind of thing so and not everyone is so I'm really glad that there's people out there working towards actually helping gamers for, of all like abilities um, disabilities ages genders anything at all anything you can think of you guys are doing great work, so thank you from, from everyone in the gaming community. I, like, really blown away by. I, I'm so happy with all this. I'm so lucky to have people who want to make stuff for me. Or just want to, like, buy stuff and give it to me. Not, not everyone gets to say that. Not everyone gets to do that. I'm so lucky. Again, privileged <laughs> is what I'd say. Because not, not everyone 
is even able to, like, have the opportunities to be able to do YouTube in general, or play games, or anything like that. A lot of people just have the internet on their phones, their really old phones, and they come to you for as an outlet to be able to play these games, to be able to see these games, to be able to experience these things vicariously. So, I'm, I'm just really glad that I can bring that, bridge that gap between people. That some people do YouTube as well, and they watch this as, like, what, what could be, or inspiration or anything. God, that makes me sound pretentious, sorry. Um, but then you have other people who can't afford a lot of these things, or can't, don't have the luxuries for all these things. Some people don't even have internet, um, which I guess they wouldn't be able to see this video. But a lot of people who can't, like, afford to play, play games, or they're... They don't have the ability to play games, like, they might have disabilities. Again, like that charity, or that organization who are helping people play games, but... They can all experience it through these videos, and that makes me so happy. It makes me feel like I'm doing something proper with my time, with my life, with my... With, <laughs> I was gonna say my skills? I don't know if I have any skills. But, just thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you for wanting to come out to meet me. Because I want to meet you all you guys just as much as you want to meet me. And... Like, all these gifts, I don't deserve them. I really don't. A lot of you will say, Yes, Jack, you do deserve them, you help me so much, but really, no, I don't. I don't know him personally, of course, but judging solely on what's publicly available, he seems great. Especially when compared to other big YouTube personalities and Let's Players that kids watch. I know my intro contrasting him and Burnham can be read as harsh, but it comes from a place of wishing he saw value in himself, outside of his audience, and spent time on something else. Since the Paradox clip I used was from 2015, I hope his outlook has evolved some since then, and that he's in a better place. There's a lot of stuff in my life that's kind of getting to me and weighing me down, and in the last couple of weeks, I just haven't been happy in general. As I said, just so many of my friends are over there, and I want to hang out with them day to day, and do stuff with them outside of YouTube, just in general. I want to go out and hang out and go to a movie with people. Go to the beach and hang out and just chat. Go to dinner. Go play bowling or something. Anything like that. I just miss my friends a lot and a lot of them are over there. I, I've, like, for the last two weeks, I don't think I've left my house at all to go do anything. Maybe to, like, go to the movies once or something like that, but I just don't go outside day to day. I'm inside all the time. And I don't really like doing that. And it gets to you after a while, and doing the same videos over and over again kind of weighs you down, so... My, my mental health has not been in the best place recently. I don't talk a whole lot publicly or in my videos about my personal life or my friendships with other artists and content creators, because that isn't the world's business. But I am pretty obviously friends with H-Bomber Guy. I've been on his streams, and we make videos together. I became friends with H-Bomb in a roundabout way through my work. I can't speak for Harris, but I somehow doubt we would be friends now if I had spent all of my time poring over the minutia of his personal life and obsessing over his appearance, when he's clearly just a person trying to make good video essays on games and politics. Not that you only have value if you make content, that's obviously ludicrous. I just mean that I've worked to establish my own identity on top of being respectful of the boundaries of people I'm a fan of. Whenever I work with or post photos of Harris and myself, or of my friend Devin and myself, I get weird comments and messages asking if we're dating. Because one, if I work with a dude creatively, we're obviously dating. And two, that's definitely a normal, non-invasive thing to ask someone. Even at my relatively low level of attention and with my repeated establishment of boundaries, I get weird invasive questions and I know as my audience grows, it'll probably only get worse. I do attach on some level the worth of my work to the people who tell me I changed their minds and made them less elitist or less of an edgelord or inspired a passion for film in them or helped them through a difficult time. That's amazing. That means a lot to me. I cannot begin to imagine what it means to Markiplier when he doesn't make a wish fulfillment, or what that connection means to the parents of a dying child. I have a very close friend who quit drinking, in part because of an episode of Crack's podcast that David Wong did, and it was a huge turning point in his life. I've certainly been helped out by feeling a connection with media figures that I'll talk about in episode 4, but obviously, from the very first video essay I published on this channel over three years ago, YouTube channels like Every Frame of Painting and Red Letter Media inspired and encouraged me. One Piece has meant a lot to me for 15 years, but past the self-evident issues when you get sucked into a parasocial fantasy from an audience point of view, from the creator point of view, I know that I have to be careful, because once the attention leaves the work that I willingly put out there and starts being about me, if I let it affect how I look at myself, or let people I don't know start to try to grasp at more of me than I'm willing to give, if I let view counts and fan attention determine my self-worth, that's dark. That's poison. So please understand that every harsh moment in this essay comes from personal experience. 
I cannot deny the value that parasocial relationships can hold, but I've seen their dark side, both for fans and personas, close up. And I think that, collectively, we can do better. He's living the dream, and we get to come along and live it with him. I like this. It makes me feel like I have friends. Pathetic. A safe space for ficto-romantics, ficto-sexuals, or anyone attracted to any type of fictional characters. You do more for my positive emotions in one video than most people can do in a month. Well, time to end it all. Oh! I'll just delay it 57 minutes. I've been single for four years now, and I feel alone. All my friends have boyfriends, and my crush doesn't feel the same. But your videos are the closest thing I have to a relationship, and I'm so glad that you make them. Thank you so much. You mean more to some of us than we matter to ourselves. Stay strong. For us. Yay, I have friends again. Very briefly. Collapses in helpless sobbing, clutching the monitor tight. Hell yeah, Sanji's my fucking dude. <laughs> Zoro is a savage! I just want one day with Bo. Maybe I'll get cancer and can have Make-A-Wish ask him so he can say no. I want to drink with Mike and Jay so bad. My friends are here! This seriously the only YouTube channel that makes me immediately click on their new content. The only thing in my life that excites me, really. You guys are my parasocial friends. 67 upvotes. It really is like having friends for an hour. Each new upload is as if Senpai noticed you. Adrienne Taylor was diagnosed with adrenal cancer when she was 16 years old. With her life on the line and not much hope, her sister Sophie, who had shared a profound love for Markiplier as much as her sister did, set her up with Make-A-Wish Foundation to meet her well-known hero. But will it end up being more than a one-time thing? Will her bigger with of being with him come true? This actually felt like I was personally with Jack. Then, mission accomplished. Jack, you do this once to twice a month to really connect with us as we all are feeling we are personally with you. Like to get this to Jack! A day with Jack, a day with Jack. This is more important than anything else in your life. Jack? <laughs> Jack is a cuck. You know, Septiplier used to make me smile all the time. It was my sunshine. They were so perfect. I mean, I know that they would never be together, but seeing them play around and being the goofballs that they are together made me smile. And now they don't even talk anymore. You don't feel the bright sunny energy you used to when they are in a room together. Jack moved on to Felix. People are making a new love story for them. And I'm sitting here at three in the morning crying over the red and green beans that used to make me happy. Septiplier is gone. We all know that. And I want it back more than anything. I just want my sunshine back. 5.6 thousand people like this post. Do you think it would be healthy or unhealthy of me to develop a parasocial relationship with the hosts of the trap and the wider Chapoverse? It's honestly the healthiest thing you can do. But when I was around 11 or possibly 12, the episode where Bulma and Vegeta begin their relationship was broadcast in my country. I immediately sunk in a deep, deep depression. The first time I'd been betrayed by a woman. Not just any woman, the woman of my dreams. Don't say a 2D girl can't hurt you. They can. Take it from me. This all really happened, and it happened because of anime. One Piece has a lot of flashback scenes, but they're there for one reason. They started when I thought that by acquainting you all with even the childhoods of these characters, you'd feel like you've been with them since they were children. Things like... Oh, uh, luffy has been terrible at telling lies since he was a kid. Or... He used to be such a crybaby. Or... He's grown up so much. Or... He hasn't changed at all. I feel like a deep bond has developed between you all and Luffy and his friends. RLM is the reason I haven't killed myself. Yet. Relationship status? Who's that guy in your pics then? Who's Devin? Ah, th thanks for the clarification. You look really happy together. That, that That's the main reason I asked the question, DBH. Even as Jack makes a general statement about the fact that we matter, I just feel so grateful, as if he's talking to me, in particular. I have such an awful pain in my chest right now. I've spent the last five years of my life being so bombarded by opinions of other people, good, bad, or indifferent, that like, you, don't, you don't realize what that's doing to you until you're actually away from it. And it wasn't until I sat down and thought about it that when I started off doing my channel, it was it was something I loved doing because 
I, I had felt left out in life. I felt like I was an outcast in a lot of the things I was doing and I, I wanted to start it because I saw other people do it and I saw people inviting all these these people on the internet to join in and be part of this community and family that they were creating cool stuff together and I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm lonely, I'm sad. The, being part of these communities makes me feel happy so I wanted to go out there and do that for other people and I wanted to try and help people achieve their best and just lead them in a, in a good direction. That version of myself when I started off, like that energetic, bubbly, loud, sweary kind of person, that, that was just what I was, that's who I was. And it was an extension of myself, obviously that's not the way I am all the time. Nobody can be turned up to 11 all the time, but playing video games and interacting with them and interacting with you guys was where I felt most at home and felt like the best version of myself, so that, that it brought out that side of me so much more than anything else. I hadn't realized that after a while that kind of became like a caricature of me and then I ended up becoming that version of myself by just turning on the camera and just turning it on. It, it was dishonest to do it that way because I wasn't being myself and freaking out about my schedule and freaking out about letting people down just built up this well of anxiety and sadness in me that I didn't know was there and it just kept building and building and building. I, I was worried about admitting that stuff to myself and I was worried about admitting it to other people because I felt like if I did that then it would become true even though it was already true anyway but I was I was afraid that it would change something about myself and I was I was so worried that this like positive energy that I was giving off that if I admitted that I'm not happy all the time that other people w would stop believing in that cause so I always tried to I always tried to lead by example and be as positive as I could be and to give off a good message and it's something that I wholeheartedly believe in but at, at some point I realized that I had built all this stuff onto a pedestal so high that I could never actually get there and I could never keep that up for a really long time so instead of it chipping away it all just came crumbling down at one point. They say it's, it's like the me generation, it's not. It's not, the arrogance is taught or it was cultivated, it's, it's self-conscious. So many people are feeling the burnout of doing this type of YouTube because YouTube shifted in such a direction that the grind is stronger than ever. The, the need to constantly be updating people on what you're doing. Social media, it's just the market's answer to a generation that demanded to perform. To constantly be making content. So the market said here, perform everything. To constantly be pushing it out into your faces. To each other all the time for no reason. Because that's just what the machine likes. The machine likes quantity. But a lot of people are starting to realize that that's just... It's prison. Unsustainable after a while. It's horrific. It is performer and audience melded together. What do we want more than to lie in our bed at the end of the day and just watch our life as a satisfied audience member? I know very little about anything. But what I do know is that if you can live your life without an audience, you should do it. Thank you so much to all of the people listed here, either for voice acting, notes on the script or the edit, research help, moral support, or some combination of the above. And additional thanks to Harris, Devin, and Graham for their tireless support of my creative endeavors, which has always gone above and beyond, and which I appreciate immensely. So, there was part two! Part three is going to be focused on academic research surrounding parasocial relationships, and part four will deal with my own experiences with them, and my own personal take on them. Also, I'm definitely not an expert on some of the topics I covered in this video, and I struggle with pronunciation here and there. So I'm 100% open to corrections and suggestions for further research. I also think everything in this video is up to date, but I've been working on it for around a year, so I'm open to corrections for anything I missed there as well. This was sort of an experiment and a challenge to myself to see if I could pull off a feature-length video essay. I am very grateful for my patrons, but I can't sustain doing this again at my current level. I can't rationalize making what is essentially a feature-length documentary for a few hundred dollars. So, if you enjoyed this, and you want to see more of this, please sign up and become a patron of mine. Because if I get to the level of Patreon backing where I can be more financially stable and not have to rely on freelance, 
I'd love to make more in-depth, feature-length videos. And in the future, maybe not take a whole year to finish one. Uh, here's most of the music that I used. Uh, an instrumental version of Kendrick Lamar's King Kunta. Lots of Lemon Demon music, mostly off of Spirit Phone. Lots of Lyric Wolf's Bo Barnum piano covers, which you can find on YouTube. And Taylor Davis's Binks Sake cover. And thanks, as always, for watching. Email me, Richard. FaceTime me, Richard. Call on me, Richard. Get some damn lunch with me, Richard. Okay, so there should be links in the video. So that's the place to go if you by any chance happen to know any way to meet Richard Dreyfus. I would kill you all to meet Richard Dreyfus. I would kill you all to meet Richard Dreyfus.